welcome, welcome, welcome. There are a few, few people who are waiting to uh, retreat from up in town, but we're going to get started in the meantime. Uh, there's so much to talk about. So overwhelmingly much to talk about. <laughs> um, and a certain amount of time. Um, before we get started with introductions, before I try to uh, phrase a, a welcoming, I just want to point, I don't know if Emma's in the room. This is Emma Barr Bittman, who is helping coordinate this event. <laughs> Housekeeping notes, anything? Um, just keep me posted if you need things, because anything logistically, let me know. Um, I'm sure you've all found bathrooms that are right over there. Um, if you're finding that you have dietary needs that aren't being met, let us know. Um, we also have a handful of tickets left for tonight's performance that are being held, so if you found that after seeing it last night you'd like to see it again, uh, let Stacy know. Sorry for the question. But that's it. Otherwise, just Thank you. Um, this is one of these things that is uh, sort of unsolvable for me, where I write the something something in one notebook and then I have to switch to another notebook and then I have to go to the computer and then I have to get a giant board noteboard and then I have to. Uh, and the the place where the things coalesce never seems to find the right template. <laughs> the right size paper or the right instrument. So I'm going to accept that as a fact in this very moment, uh, even though I have one, two, three things in front of me. Um, I'll just try and, and just very briefly, because I think a lot has already been said, um, and a lot will be said, and I think that's why we're here. Um, what's essential to know about this gathering is that this is uh, rooted in the simple belief that coming together to meet holds tremendous value. Um, like theater, there's an ephemeral power or quality to these types of meetings. Um, a skeptical side can say, you know, uh, why, you know, we'll come together, have a great time, and then it'll disappear, so why? But for me, I think there's so many important reasons why being together in person holds true. Um, it's hard to remember sometimes that, uh, at least for myself, that I'm a part of a whole, or that we are a part of a whole. and. Um, that's one desire, one impetus for this, is to reconnect with being a part of a whole. There's a desire to listen more deeply to one another, um, and hopefully conditions like these allow us to listen more deeply than we can in our accelerated lives. Um, there's a, a, a more imperative need to respond to the world around us um, than ever before, and to interact, interact with each other. Um, and there's also a desire and a need to develop an active imagination about things that uh, we don't know about, that I don't know about. So this is one way of developing those, that, that muscle. Um, some people will have, uh, take, take issue with the term or the word, the choice of the word survival. Um, and I just, I, I like the word survival. Um, I don't feel need to defend it. I think other words are good too, whether it's rival or evolution, um, whatever you want to pick is also good. For me, it's a word that I met early on um, when I first came to Double Edge. Uh, in a frenzy, I decided to do the cliched act of, of looking it up in the dictionary, and I found something sort of funny, so I'll read that, which is survival is a state or fact of continuing to live or exist, typically in spite of an accident, ordeal, or difficult circumstances. Um, and then the example they give is the animal's chance at survival were pretty low. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first thing that comes up just from Googling it. Google has its own sensibilities, its own skeptical sensibilities. Um, and then the second definition is an object or a practice that has continued to exist from an earlier time which is nice, except the, the example is, is a little banal, which is uh, his shorts were a survival from his army days. Uh, so interestingly, if the internet and Google represents some collective consciousness, the metaphors and the choices are, are something. 
and I think um, this convening is uh, somehow a desire to respond to a collective consciousness that exists. And that collective consciousness exists in the way people believe, the way people connect to greater meaning and purpose, the way people respond and uh, relate to the land, the way people respond and relate to the environment as a whole, and then the way people respond and relate to each other. And when we look around, there's a lot of examples of, uh, of amazingness, of beauty, of harmony, of heightened possibilities. And then there's uh, a fair amount of glaring violence uh, to ourselves, <laughs> to the land, to the environment, and to each other. Um, and this is happening in some uh, deep collective way. Um, that's why we are gathering. That's why survival. Um, that's why art and survival. Um, so over the course of, of this day and a half, uh, there will be these, these lenses, these conversations. They have different leaders. Um, there are some focus, semi-focus groups in these, but it's open. Yeah, so feel free for it to feel open, for it to be interruptive, and to participate uh, intuitively and instinctively. Um, I'll stop there. There, we would like to do some introductions. I need to say a couple, one important thing I forgot already, which is that uh, we are live streaming this, web streaming this live, uh, thanks to HowlRound. And one thing that'll be helpful in that process is everyone to airplane mode your phones um, because it'll help with the bandwidth. We're in a rural place, you had noticed. Um, and I say I do that. coffee and water, it's hot in here, please feel free to get up and get whatever you need as we go. Um, the fans are off because of sound, is that right? Yeah, okay. All right, if it gets too warm, um, someone over here, just flip it back on, please. Um, I want to take a, a moment to acknowledge uh, those that have made this convening possible. Uh, we're very fortunate, we're very grateful to have had the support from uh, Doris Duke, uh, foundation here. Uh, thank you very much to Doris Duke, to New England Foundation for the Arts, to Alternate Roots, to um, the Ethics and Common Good Project at Hampshire College, um, to HowlRound uh, at Arts Emerson. Thank you, HowlRound, as well as the support of some local businesses and restaurants, and to volunteers that are here helping as well. Um, we are very grateful for the support this opportunity. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, before we begin individual introductions, I'm going to turn it over to Betsy. She's going to help us uh, acknowledge this place. Hi, I'm Betsy Leobald Richards. Um, I'll explain who I am later when we actually do that formally. But this is actually a practice um, that I try to many of my um, my brothers and sisters in Indian country, but across the world um, as indigenous people. Um, and what we're seeing is that this practice of indigenous protocol is being adopted in many other spaces. Um, and all it is is just to take a moment, um, ground ourselves in this land, and to give thanks to our traditional hosts. Um, that would that is the Stockbridge Mohegan uh, people. Um, and also the Wampanoag, the Aquino Wampanoag, and the Mashpee Wampanoag of this state. Um, and to say thank you to them, to acknowledge them, that they're still here, and that, that we give thanks for um, holding this gathering. Um, with that in mind, thank you. or maybe didn't tell you that um, you're on the farm here at Double Edge. How many people have been here for the first time right now? Great. And, and so this farm has been here for how long? That you guys have been here? 1994 we moved here. Okay. 
So hopefully if you are curious and you saw the performance last night and you want to like see a little more, I would encourage you to talk to anybody here from Double Edge. You can raise your hand if you're from Double Edge. Just to get to little, uh, know a little more about the introduction to the space you're in. Um, I'd love for you to think of this as a, a, a one full day and a half of introduction. So while we can't just introduce every little detail about ourselves in this circle, think of this day today and tomorrow morning and tonight as a means to just go up to people you're curious about and want to know more about. Um, so I'm going to model how we're going to introduce ourselves, and I would encourage you to help me out. And I'm going to facilitate it if you get a little rambly. Uh, <laughs> but um, my name is Nick Sly. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I work with an organization called Mondo Bizarro, and I, I make live performances, and I do a lot of cultural organizing. I am Betsy Theobald Richards. Um, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I am a director uh, who a lot of my career has been dedicated to uplifting the voices of Native playwrights. Uh, but I also found myself being a, um, I'm a former funder with the Ford Foundation where I focused on Native arts and cultures. And now I um, have taken that work and for the last uh, five years have been leading uh, work in a social justice organization, a national social justice organization, to lead their work on arts and social justice. It's called the Opportunity Agenda. Uh, I'm Claudia Alec. I live in Ashland, Oregon. I'm community producer at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Uh, I'm a poet, playwright, director, theater maker, change maker, and am slightly obsessed right now with race, and climate change. Mm. Uh, I'm Morgan Janess. I commit a lot of acts of dramaturgy, primarily. Uh, I I've, I've work as a teacher. Uh, I've been an agent. I've been at several theaters in, in literary development. But I've just recently started a consultancy called In This Distracted Globe, which focuses on the intersection of uh, I'm Javier from Chile, live in Holyoke, Massachusetts, have been working at the intersection of art and organizing for about 15 or so years, and most recently have started directing a new program out of Hampshire College called Ethics and the Common Good. My name is Monique Verda. Uh, I live just south of New Orleans in St. Bernard Parish. I am a member of the United Home and Nation. Um, just recently uh, took a seat with the Tribal Council. Um, I do documentary work. I have a film that came out called My Louisiana Love in 2012. Um, I don't know, I do lots of arts work stuff. Um, <laughs> it just depends. Uh, and currently I'm working on No New Leases campaign um, in the Gulf as it is the biggest carbon grab happening in our nation. My name is Chantal Pilodeau. I'm a playwright and translator, and I'm the artistic director of a um, small company called The Arctic Cycle, which is, uh, was created to support the writing, development, and production of eight plays about the impact of climate change on the eight countries of the Arctic. And I also am the founder of a blog called Artists and Climate Change, which features artists from all disciplines who address climate change in their work. Good morning. My name is Keita Sullivan. I'm a member of the Montaukett and Shinnecock Nations. Um, I am a funder. I fund the National Theatre Project. Um, that's what I do currently, um, funding devised ensemble theatre work. I am also a recovering environmental justice attorney. <laughs> 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 um, so, that, uh, so there's a lot of intersection there. I'm the parent of an artist, the wife of an artist, so this is kind of, this is my life. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Cheryl Akimia. I'm based in New York with the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and uh, my, my program is the funding of performing arts, so we fund individual artists, organizations, and the national sector, which means uh, helping national service organizations as well. Um, and we also have an environment program within our, um, within the foundation, as well as uh, child well-being and uh, medical research program. In addition, we have uh, a, another program which is uh, called Building Bridges. It's about um, 
building more uh, understanding of Muslim arts and culture. Uh, I think that one of the things that I'm always looking for is where there's a, an opportunity for cross-sector learning. And um, so we all often try to partner with our other program areas to see if there's some new ways that we can work together and, and go beyond the scope of our normal activities. So this is an, another opportunity for me to do that, especially with a focus on land here. Um, but thank you so much for the opportunity for allowing me to be here and um, to also help with this convening in, in a small way. Um, my name is Gina Riker. I'm an artist and architect that lives in Detroit, Michigan. And um, my husband and I run a neighborhood-based organization where we live and work called Powerhouse Productions. And um, we basically have created a network of arts and culture spaces in our little residential corner of Detroit. Uh, my name is Bear Adair. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I'm originally trained as a visual artist, but have found my way into theater. Um, so now I do uh, object fabrication, uh, costume design, writing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm co-artistic director of a small ensemble there called New Noise. Um, and I'm also one of the lead organizers on uh, a project called Last Call, the New Orleans Dyke Bar History Project. <laughs> Good morning, uh, my name is Bob Martin. Um, I'm a Kentuckian, a theater maker, um, activist, and a teaching artist. Also the caretaker of a piece of uh, forested land in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, where I also create work with and for my community and other communities around me. I'm also the outgoing board chair for Alternate Roots. I'm Vijay Matthew, I'm with HowlRound, which is based in Emerson College in Boston. And it's now um, how around five years old, and we call ourselves a Knowledge Commons by and for uh, the theater community. And I work with Jamie Galoon, and I'm an administrator of uh, these platforms. Hi, my name is uh, Mark Valdez. Uh, I live in Los Angeles. I am a director, writer, uh, do a lot of work uh, in and with communities around the country and uh, trying to figure out how to do more of this in my own community of Los Angeles. Hello, I'm Jennifer Dowley. I live in Millerton, New York, which is a um, small speck of a place about two hours away. Uh, for many, many years, I worked in the nonprofit sector primarily with visual artists as both running nonprofits and um, as a funder. Um, but the last 17 years, I was the head of a community foundation of the county just uh, west of here, Berkshire County and some surrounding counties. So my work uh, for the first time was not arts focused and just was all about the well-being of this community. How do we make life better for everybody? It was, it was just extraordinary. I wore myself out. And so now I'm um, doing other things, and I am just so happy to be here because it means coming back into the world of artists where um, optimism, determination, imagination is front and foremost. And I've joined the board of the Wasayak Project, a really interesting group in a, in a hamlet not, not far from me that is embedding itself in the community. It's impoverished. Um, lack of hope, and so I, I feel like I'm, I'm bringing back to them what, what I'm hearing with you today and tomorrow, so thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Susan Clampett from Washington, D.C. Uh, you can read about me in here, but <laughs> I'm going to update you um, to say that the two things that I'm doing now that mean a great deal to me um, are that I'm a commissioner for the Washington DC Arts and Humanities Commission and I am in charge of all grant programs there. Uh, we give it out about um, seven million dollars a year which is nice for a city um, including artist fellowships. And uh, the second, maybe the first, actually the first, is that I'm um, vice chair and a founding trustee of the new Mosaic Theater in Washington. Many of you have followed Ari Roth's work. Um, we are now starting our second season. Uh, and I, uh, I am so over the top with joy and excitement at what is going on in Washington and what Mosaic is bringing to American theater.
I'm Marion West. I also live in Millerton, New York. I'm a visual artist, a baker, and I will be starting Bennington in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Jamie Galoon. Um, I work, with, work in HowlRound with the J. Uh, we're based in Boston, like you said, and really everything that we're trying to do is about knowledge sharing and community building, and so I'm so lucky to be in this room. Thank you for letting us document um, this couple of days. And, Please, if we want to know what work you're doing, um, we want to put the word out about work that matters and share it with the broadest community possible. So please talk to me or Vijay over the next couple of days if you if you have something you'd like to share. Can you time out there and come down the line from Sita? And Will, we'll come back mm -hmm. to you. Sita, could you introduce yourself? Hi, um, uh, my name is Sita Magnuson. I'm a graphic facilitator based in East Hampton. Um, basically what that means is, means is that I listen and I draw and I interpret visually and create conversations into dialogue, so I'm doing that today. Who are you? <laughs> yeah, come on. Oh, go ahead. Who are you? My name is Travis Coe, and I'm an intern at Double Edge Theater. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> yeah, Chicago. Yeah. Come on down, you can do it, yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name is Felipe. I'm from Chile. I'm a musician, and I'm here to I'm a music volunteer here in Double Edge. I'm Melissa McDonald. I'm an apprentice at Double Edge. I'm Rachel Reese. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, and I'm an apprentice with Double Edge. Uh, my name is Kian Hunt. I'm from Montana, and I'm a student here. My name is Miha Puriata. Uh, I'm a designer, and I work with Double Edge. I'm from Poland originally. Hi, my name is Paola Pilnik. I'm originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil and I go to Calix. Hi, I'm Tinta Silve, and I go to Hampshire College. I'm Camila, I'm from Santiago de Chile, and I'm studying here also. Uh, good morning, my name is Maria Bernardo Suzuki, and I've been photographing Double Edge since 2011. Hi, my name is Amanda. Um, I'm originally from California, and I'm a student at the Boston Conservatory and a student at Double Edge. Hi, I'm Hannah Burke. Um, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Came to Double Edge by way of Chicago, and I'm a student here. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> I'm Desiree, and I'm a student of Double Edge now, and still Boston University. Still have the camera. Uh oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Stafford. <laughs> um, actor, videographer, and I've been training and helping out Double Edge for about eight years. I'm Milena Dubova. I'm um, an actor and associate director at Double Edge. Um, I'm also part of the web streaming team. Um, I'm Joelle. Um, I grew up in Chile as well. Um, and I am a student here at Double Edge. Hi, I'm John Peto. I'm the musical director of Double Edge Theatre and um, just doing the audio here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> one, one more before Will. Hi, good morning. I'm Ebony Golden, coming um, to you from the South Bronx, New York. I'm from Houston, mm -hmm. Texas originally. Mm -hmm. I'm the device theater maker, cultural agitator. I'm currently working on a piece called 125th and Freedom. It's a river to river piece that travels down 125th Street and um, explores the intersection of um, the Underground Railroad and um, this cultural and political corridor. My name, is, excuse me, my name is Will McAdams, and I'm a community-based playwright. And uh, right now I find myself writing a lot about how white power shapes my most intimate relationships. Um, a lot of my work, I spent five years doing plays in partnership with farming communities in <clears throat> New York and in California. And I teach at Hampshire College in the theater program. My name is Chip Thomas. I'm originally from North Carolina. I presently live and work in Northern Arizona out of the Navajo Nation. I've been there 29 years now as a primary care physician. Um, and in 2009, I started doing a public art project um, reflecting some of the beauty of the community back to the people um, along the roads. Right. Hi, my name is Matthew Fluharty. I am from Appalachian, Ohio. I currently live in Winona, Minnesota, which is a small city along the Mississippi. I am a writer and visual artist, and um, I direct an organization called Art of the Rural, which does a lot of cross-sector pro projects, sort of thinking about um, kind of like the contemporary rural condition in our culture, 
art, design. Uh, and I'm also a member of a project called M12 Studio, which does uh, kind of contemporary um, installations, collaborations, and research projects across rural America. And I'm also a proud board member of the Worm Farm Institute. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Carrie Brunk. I'm here from uh, Clear Creek, Kentucky. And uh, I do facilitation work primarily. I come at this work from an organizing background. And um, right now I'm managing a project, facilitating and leading a project called uh, Ridgeway, a transformative leadership experience, which is a leadership program for uh, people in Central Appalachia who are doing the work of transition to a post-coal economy, politics, and um, culture. And I'm also uh, managing a program called the Intercultural Leadership Institute for um, Alternate Roots, uh, the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, PAI Foundation, and First Peoples Fund, um, which is a leadership program uh, for artists and arts professionals. Hi, my name is Dipankar Mukherjee. I'm uh, originally from India, and I'm coming here from Minneapolis. Uh, I'm the artistic director of a theater called Pangea World Theater. Uh, uh, where we do a lot of work with very few people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we find ourselves at the intersection of uh, social justice, um, uh, art and politics. Uh, and uh, and we, we, uh, we, uh, I primarily direct, I'm a director. And, um, uh, we are a strong community of building communities, and uh, we try to create a space, uh, you know, where we can have difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Garneau. I was born and raised in Chicago, currently living on the road and in Kentucky with these beautiful people living and collaborating on Clear Creek. Um, I'm a performing artist. I recently completed a five-year performance project called Uprising, and now I'm finishing a book about that project, coming out soon. And I am a member of the Executive Committee of Alternate Roots, which, in case you don't know, is an organization of artists and activists um, who uh, locate their selves and their work primarily in the U.S. South. Um. Carlos Juliana, um, originally from Buenos Aires, we moved here 20 years ago, and one of the co-artistic directors of the World Theater, primarily, uh, I'm an actor, and in, by that I mean many things that I'm probably not going to say now, or <laughs> even imagine, uh, but... Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't think I'm an actor in the sense of performing, but, but in the sense of acting upon things that I think need to be acted upon, including performing. Is it finished? I think so. Oh. <laughs> I mean, maybe not. <laughs> I'm Stacy Klein, I'm the founder of Double Edge. I'm in a daze at night because of our performance, but during the day, I really would like to show you all um, this place that we've been on for 22 years now, and um, are part of the probably 400 years of people transformation of this place. Matthew Glassman, uh, co-artistic director of Double Edge. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Daniel Alexander-Jones, I'm a performance artist, uh, recording artist, I live in New York City. Um, I have familial roots not far from here, my grandmother was born in Shelburne Falls on a farm in 1908, you know, told me about riding the horse and buggy to school. Um, but, but yeah, I'm really excited to be here, um, particularly because I've come to understand a lot of my practice is actually been contemplative, and um, that's been something that's been invisible because we mainly focus on what we make. But um, yes, yeah, so excited to be part of this conversation. 
I want to know about that. Um, my name is Todd London. I'm the director of the School of Drama at the University of Washington in Seattle. I've been there for two years, and prior to that, I was in uh, I was the artistic director of a place called New Dramatists in New York, which is a beautiful laboratory theater for playwrights. Uh, I write about the theater. I write fiction, um, and uh, Beyond that, I'm still trying to figure out what I am. Hi, I'm Barbara Schaefer Bacon, and I'm sitting here realizing that my only theater credential is the lead in the Music Man in fifth grade at Girl Scout Camp. No! No! It was Girl Scout Camp, so I really was the lead. So, uh, meanwhile, that camp is in the Berkshires in Otis, Mass, and I'm from here, Western Massachusetts, Springfield, and I live and work in Belchertown. And from there, with Pam Corza, I've been able to co-lead uh, Animating Democracy, which has been looking at your work um, deeply and helping to try document it and find other means to get it um, to be really lifted up, we hope. Um, and right now we're working on a project that some of you have been involved in helping to birth um, and, and help us to shape, um, which is looking at the attributes of excellence in art for change work. We'll talk about it. Yeah. I'm David Bollier. I live in Amherst, Massachusetts, nearby. And for the past 20 years or so, I've been an activist, scholar, blogger, author on the commons as a new paradigm for conceptualizing economic, political, social change. Hi, right behind us. What's your name, man? Simon. Simon. Welcome. Hi, I'm Laura Brennan. I'm the director of the Math Fund, which is a grant-making organization that, that provides support to new works, that, um, particularly works that look at disrupting hierarchies. Let's leave it at that. So. Mm -hmm. I'm Zoe. I'm an intern at Double Edge Theater, and I, I use they, them, their pronouns. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Jeff Freeman. Mm -hmm. I'm the um, development director here at Double Edge Theater. Thank you very much. Anything else? One last thing is that um, I'll be trying to track for myself, and there's some sticky pads here and a resource board. And so as, as, as you hear resources that you're curious about or resources you want to share, if you would stick them and put them on this board, at the end of this weekend, we're going to uh, make them available to you in some sort of digitized form. And in absentia? Uh, in absentia, who cannot introduce themselves because they're not here, sadly. Uh, Jawale Willa Josala from the Urban Bush Woman is unfortunately has laryngitis and is sick. Uh, just ran a very great institute. And Carlton Turner from Alternate Roots was to be with us, but he has just, uh, there has been the arrival of a, a new baby. And uh, Tristan Ali uh, uh, Turner came a little early, so <laughs> uh, couldn't be with us, but they both send their regards. Um, our first conversation is, oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the brilliant work that you saw yesterday. Yeah. Um, our first conversation is uh, really interested, as you probably read, in um, different types of mystical thought. Um, the contemplative, uh, the source of poetry, of metaphor, um, inner work. Um, many of us are here, not all of us are somehow connected to the live arts, um, which is an outward expression and really requires a, a ton of outwardness, a ton of engaging with people, with community, of, of manifesting uh, aesthetics and all sorts of things that go out. Um, this process, in my mind, begins with uh, a lot of inwardness. And <clears throat> there's uh, such a wealth of incredible traditions within um, the artistic paradigm, but also going into um, the spiritual, or even in, at times the religious or the non-secular, that uh, have proven to be really rich and informative to this development of our inner work. Um, to where do we, how do we cultivate our source of belief? Um, where, how do we cultivate energy? Uh, how do we access a heightened self in our work 
Um, this means at times going beyond the rational. This time, at times means going in towards myth, um, towards spirituality. Um, these are things that are not easy to talk about. These are things that we often, that they're often are private for good reason or, or personal. Um, and in some cases though, it's also very, there's are, there are practical manifestations of this. Um, study. <laughs> um, in the Jewish tradition of, of Talmud, this was a, a, a form of study, of reading and writing, of contemplation, that was meant in some ways to access another way of, of ecstatic being, um, and discourse, and dialogue, as, and argument. Um, so it's not purely intangible or esoteric. Um, there's practicalities, and, and for me at Double Edge, um, meeting Stacy and Carlos in my early years, I uh, was really instrumental because there was a model here. Here, here. <laughs> here. Adolescence is hard. Adolescence is hard. Yeah. <laughs> a burden I would carry. Um, meeting these guys here at a time uh, where a, finding a path that could be rich in meaning and also finding a path that could have sustainability was really important. And <clears throat> training, as we call it here, physical training uh, and artistic training, became this 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 room, right? The room of one's own, this place where uh, an artist, a young artist, an emerging artist, or a seasoned veteran artist or a master would continue to look deeply within, study, and try to find their highest possible self in order to and find revelation. Um, as the world gets more accelerated, um, as this theater grows, as, the, as technology um, colonizes the, the inside at times, um, these spaces get harder to access. Um, penetrating time, stretching it out, um, taking it back. Um, Communing with nature, um, contemplating goes against many grains. It goes against uh, a sense of, of the momentum that's ongoing, and especially if you're making work and you're in conversation with a marketplace, whether you're in a city or an urban place, that marketplace means um, it's a different set of exchanges. Let's say it's a different climate, it's a different world um, than let's say, uh, in a different pace, in a different relationship with time. So these are just some of the early thoughts about this subject. Um, I invited a few people to share a bit about their work uh, as a, a launching pad. Um, I'll respond, Nicole's gonna respond, and we will all respond um, as this conversation goes, so I'd like to keep it open. Um, Mr. Punker, I'd love to start with you. And I'd love just to start with a very simple question. Um, I've never seen your work. Um, I've read your bio. <laughs> I've met you. And I know, and I've also seen, I've looked at, um, at some of the research that, that you've done and Penji has done. And I, I'm just curious to know about, if you can say in a couple of minutes, um, speak a little bit about your practice. Um, you talk about, um, the importance of spirituality in your work. Um, I noticed the Conference of the Birds as being a, an important performance uh, for Pangea. And this is, for those who don't know, Conference of the Birds is beautiful um, parable and poem, um, which actually maybe you can speak a little bit about that research as well. Um, sort of bring us in a little bit to your, your practice and your process, and we'll circle back to some of these ideas as it happens. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, uh, the fact that we don't talk about it is that's why we don't have pat answers. You know? uh, but we have to really. Uh, well, uh, some of our practice, and I'll talk about the literature uh, or that we choose. Uh, uh, we always begin with first acknowledging, you know, the land on on which uh, we stand. We always center the indigenous. Uh, uh, in all, in all possible way, 
uh, you know, by in, in by the presence of uh, indigenous artists in our group, uh, uh, people in our board, people on our staff, people on our so centering the land. That's why we could not continue without acknowledging what we saw yesterday. Uh, you know, have to bring in the awareness of where we are. That's. Uh, um, uh, apparently, is 20 years old. Um, uh, no, my career is longer than that. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so we always begin with uh, two minutes. Uh, what we have, here, what we have come to articulate as uh, two minutes of silence. We we call it two minutes. It's really not 120. Uh, it, it's just a metaphor. Uh, we, we, because we work with people from so many different backgrounds uh, and uh, we consciously bring in people who, who think differently from each other uh, and the search is always can we still arrive at the center uh, uh, and center meaning a place where the work gets done you know? uh, because I love the way you phrased uh, the topic uh, the, that is the praxis of it not theory you know not uh, talk that sounds good, but uh, but how do we really practice all this that comes out of our mouth? Um, uh, and uh, so we begin with two minutes of silence, where uh, somebody rings a bell. We always have a lamp, and we arrived at that. It was the ensemble that crafted arrived at that. We didn't begin with that. Uh, we began with uh, after one year of clear planning. The first day was a complete disaster. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, that's why we arrive. You know, I love the power and rigor of the word arrive uh, because, uh, you know, it's not where we start from. So we, uh, the, I mean, we started with, after one year, we planned it to that. I, I was coming out of a regional theater in town and after five years, I bought, with all my savings, I bought myself out of my contract, uh, you know, to start Pangea because we wanted to have literature conversations like this. And uh, so we planned it all out. And so we started with, uh, you know, uh, so, it, like, we planned it to the T because we had one year of time to plan. <laughs> this is what will happen, then you say this, then we'll do this, and then we'll pre read the text. And we, our first uh, choice of literature was Conference of the Birds. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the disruption uh, was that, you know, so Jim Northrop was a very uh, elderly artist, to, I mean, uh, na indigenous icon native artist, and so he was, uh, you know, you know, say he lit his sage and he was blessing the space, and and you know I was saying, wow, we need the blessings of elders. And then suddenly my friend Izzy Monk, who uh, uh, you know, she got she got up. Uh, she's an African American um, brilliant artist, and she got up and she started leaving the room uh, and, and say, tell him to tell him to stop, tell him to stop, tell him. So you know, and, and it just uh, went on, and everybody like there's no silence, there's nothing, there is chaos. And this we had planned it all out, and then I then I just went out and I easy to stop. And I told Jim comes and he puts his sage in the bag and he looks at me and he said, "I trusted you, I trusted you, I trusted you." I said, "Just, just, just let's all breathe." So I looked at the stage manager and said, <laughs> 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 like save, save us. Uh, 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 uh. So then I went to ask, uh, talk to Easy and. Uh, uh, he said that, and then she said that she has got fatal a a asthmatic attacks and even if it's a candle smoke that stays for half a second, oh. her, uh, uh, it collapses. And then I went to talk to Jim and I said, Jim, just stay for a few minutes. And, you know, and that became the agenda of our first year of work. You know? We had all these planned events. And first you will speak, then he will speak, then we'll read the script. It just went out of the window because of so much of distrust that was in the room. You know? So, so then I said, screw this agenda. Let's just talk about what is real in the room. And so then we arrived at this two minutes where, uh, where we thought that we'll. Uh, so somebody said, why don't we just like because we had Arabs, Arab Americans, we had indigenous people, we had pe like diversity, conscious diversity in the room. And so we rang the bell. Uh, we, somebody would ring the bell, and somebody said, I already have a lord. I don't need to bow down to any other lord. I said, Where, wherever you got that idea from, I mean, nobody is really enforcing any lords here. And, and uh, so ultimately, we arrived at two minutes of silence, complete silence, which does not have an accent, which does not have <laughs> a, a passport, a visa, uh, a nationality. And, and so that's why I, I, you know, I shared with you why we, we arrived there. We just didn't have a practice in our pocket and take it out. And, 
So, so what we do now, we ring a bell and we just breathe for two minutes. Uh, because rehearsal starts, as many artists over here know, we are meeting the deadline. Uh, six o'clock rehearsal starts at 5.45. <laughs> we are send and come and start. We act very calm for a rehearsal. So, so we wanted for those two minutes for just a breathing time for us. Just exhale. And just exhale because we have artists, many artists of color who do two jobs and then come for rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So, and this practice, uh, we, pra we have uh, started doing this in all our uh, meetings with our board. Board meetings start like that, staff meetings start like that, even foundation meetings start like that. Uh, we, uh, so we just take two minutes of just silence breathing. Uh, that's one. Then second uh, practice that we have, like what you said, uh, we have uh, contemplative practices, which is a rigor of our ensemble training. Uh, you know, we invite uh, um, uh, other people, other communities uh, for any, uh, for we pra regularly practice yoga and a type of South Indian martial art called Kalari Payet, Kalari which uh, you know, I've been practicing uh, for a few, many years, uh, few years, um, uh, and uh, uh, which is also based on yoga, which is based on breathing, which is based on, uh, it's, it's considered to be the mother of all martial arts, yes. uh, uh, Kalari. Um, then choices of literature, uh, uh, the choices of literature, the, how we were, the conference of the birds is one choice, it's a Fariduddin Attar's, uh, you know, he's a Farsi Sufi, uh, poet and uh, we chose that to be our first piece and then after 20 years uh, you know what does that mean you know uh, uh, that everybody you know our social media person says that you know it should be a signature of all your uh, I mean all the social media but but we really stopped all this marketing uh, jargon and said what does it really mean to be 20 years you know so uh, we wanted to go back in and, and, and ask ourselves that question so that's why there was a uh, Let's revisit the script. Uh, the, the piece was about the conference of the birds. Mina adapted it with uh, Farsi scholars, and we used a lot of the language, uh, uh, um, the uh, the Farsi language on stage, uh, and then transitioned into English. And uh, it's about people, you know, a group of birds that fly uh, and in search of their truth, uh, and or in search of their uh, thing or truth. And ultimately, after ma after many many such stops. Uh, only a few remain, and when they arrived at that place where they thought that this is the arrival point of heaven and milk and honey and so on, all they saw was arid land and a small little hut with no, uh, you know, uh, doors, windows, and from a crack in the roof, uh, they went in, they collapsed, they were, they were almost literally dead, there was nothing left in them. And when they opened their eyes, all they saw was a room full of mirrors, and where they just saw themselves. And uh, uh, I mean, it, it, this speaks to us in various levels, and so we revisited that after 20 years, and we began with that. Uh, so those are some some of I can, I can talk more with other questions. Great. So those are our regular practices. Great. I'm gonna maybe suggest maybe we try this two minutes of silence. I apologize to everyone. <laughs> But we will do this. <laughs> I have the bell. Do you want to just ring yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, you just happen to have it with you, right? <laughs> this was all prepared. It was rehearsed between the two of you. No. So, would anybody like to ring it? You.
Afro mysticism. <laughs> so I was, you know, as many of us do, reflecting on ways to talk about what I do. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, support fundraising and advertisement, these sorts of external things, but also as a reflection of what the practice is. Um, I come out of a tradition of the black American avant-garde. Um, my, my mentors, the people who wove me into practice, were all part of the first production of For Colored Girls, uh, who considered suicide. They're movers. Their language was connected to breath and body and spirit. Um, I, have since a child, have been obsessed with, uh, with mythic systems that were not the Greeks. I've been always interested in ways of knowing the world that are um, that escape language, escape naming. Every time you name it, stuff flies away, right? Um, and also music. Music was so central to me, and that I found in listening to music, whether that be extremely pop secular music or, or music that would be considered in a sacred tradition, I found that to be the place that I felt most at home. And I was like, why, what is it about that, about sound, about the field of surrender that an individual artist must enter in order to make that sound that makes me feel so good and, and known and whole? Um, and so, you know, you tall call, like, I'm like, avant-garde and interdisciplinary and blah, 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 you know, I, I, every name you can use. And I think I had a lot of affinity with, with Afrofuturism on this idea of work that is grounded in a black American and also Afro diasporic tradition that imagines a future, right? That has a speculative component. It often engages science fiction. It is um, a, a political in a particular way. Um, and I said, yeah, that's good too, but nothing quite fits. And the reason that it didn't fit is because the core experience that I have of making the work in collaboration always, right? I don't make anything alone. Um, and having the work move in the world was that there was this experience in the room where people's hearts open. And there's an experience in the room of time living outside the boundary of past, present, future as we discuss it. There was an experience in the room of the ghosts and the yet-to-be spirit being in the room with it. And I said, this is all mystical stuff. And I was like, but it kind of comes out of black stuff. So it was like Afro-mysticism. I was like, that's it, it's Afro-mysticism. And then I went to look up who all else uses that term to talk about, you know, I was like, who are the other people who talk about it? And there weren't any other people talking about it. It was, my mind was blown that no one else had coined that or, you know, use that term in that particular way, although it is certainly practice, and I'm sure, you know, I think there's a lot of affinity with, um, you know, I think of, like, the grandfather, grandmother, but, like, the Coltrane's, John and Alice Coltrane, and, like, astral, astral thought in jazz music. But I said, well, let me start using this as a point of departure. Um, and so are there, are there aspects of the work that can be discerned and discussed as a way of trans transferring or transmitting some of this core information, how do you how do you practice this way? So um, that's where astral astral jazz. Yeah, can yeah, you say right. something about yeah, it? Yeah, so astral jazz. You know, I'm I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with John Coltrane, right? You know, and so Coltrane is is you know there comes a point. I think it's right around this uh, this recording they did called Meditations where he broke wide and went into like a, a much more modal and highly experimental form of playing that had a lot of dissonance in it. And it's the, it's the kind of jazz that uh, most people go, oh, I can't, you know, I, I, can't, I can't do it. It's too frenetic, it's too uh, disturbing. It's, its purpose is not to entertain you, but rather to unlock something in you. Um, and as he moved further into his career, right before he passed away, he, his ensemble included his wife, Alice Coltrane, who is a harpist, who was a harpist and uh, an organ player. Um, and the music was, in many ways, a kind of a record of a spiritual journey, a record of a search or an inquiry into a particular subject. Um, 
and you can listen, I think, uh, I, I can give some resource lists of some music to listen to by Alice Coltrane especially. But the idea being that, that the music in some ways, if you will, is a kind of map of a spiritual experience that the player or players are going on, right? And any map is intended to invite you onto a journey, not to limit your experience, right? But to say like, there's a bear in those woods, don't go there. That's where the water is. That's, you know, that's where, that's the road to the land. Now you go. You have your, you have your journey, you have your experience. So that's where Afro-mysticism is sort of rooted in that, you know, a little before my time, but uh, an, uh, an exploration of, um, What's even the term, sort of mysticism? Um, what does that, what does that mean to you? Well, it's you know one of my favorite sayings uh, is the devil is a lie. Have you all heard that saying before? You know, so like the, like the devil is a lie. Like that partly that means you know the devil doesn't have power, right? But it all, but it also means to me that a lie is the devil, right? Like that that when we when we say something that is a falsehood, it takes on as we're seeing nationally, uh, it takes on its own life, its own weight. It ha it, it accretes. It, it has gravitational force, right? And it is capital. It has capital. Yeah, it has capital. And mysticism for me is the truth. Like it is a, like a, like I come back to experience. I come back to a thing that can't be named, codified, sold, bar. You know, like there's not, there's not a tangible thing, um, but there is an experience that is uh, both, if you will, pre and post colonial. Right? Like it's not it's not owned and demarcated and zoned, and I'm thinking about what you said about passport, like there's no passport there. It's a, it's a space of experience that I can access, that any of us can access, that can remind us of, of our nature as part of this larger system, life system that we're living in, this globe, this earth. Um, and that may be very, sound very highfalutin, but what it, what it is for me is that it's a place where I could find truth um, and is deliberately counter to systems of hierarchy and gradation that from, I always call it auction block language, about like our identifiers as ways of, of, of discerning who we are from the outside in order to buy and sell us in one, one form or another. And there's, not, there's no currency on this in this internal landscape. Yeah. Um, so mysticism is that. It's also, you know, ecstatic, erotic, joyful, dangerous, scary, you know, like all of the, all of the forces of nature that are at work in the world, um, having a dance with them, practicing what it means to experience them. Yeah. Um. I'm going to ask you one or two more questions. Sorry, go, go for it. I like it because the coffee is not hitting it yet. No, so I don't want you to do it. Here, do you mind? Oh, oh, this oh, is good. Good. Sorry, you all see it. I'm like an addict over here. I'm like this. <laughs> um, two oh, things. that's good. Okay. I'm interested, you're talking yeah. about, you mentioned the word dance and ecstasy, yeah. and I'm thinking about uh, Joe Mama Jones, and I'm thinking about the body. and. You know, for me, the training and the body is sort of so important in this conversation. It relates to the silence. It relates to um, energy. Um, it relates to because I think we're talking about slightly different faculties than the yeah. the most predominant ones, the most speakable ones, uh, the faculties of imagination and faith and belief and prayer and memory. Uh, those are uh, in the irrational. Those are harder to track with our our seeing eyes. So, in terms of the body, um, can you say anything about this in terms of how either movement or how the body or how uh, dance or how physical transformation mm -hmm. plays into this? Yeah, yeah. Um, most of you probably don't know. But one of my probably the most. Um, well-known part of my performance work is I, I channel this persona named Jamama Jones, and she's a singer. Uh, we do I do many shows with her. I performed her for 21 years. Uh, like I, I started in the mid 90s and then stopped for a long time, and then she kind of came back when I was trying to be a very serious playwright. You know, and she's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know. 
she's, I think from the outside, people assume, oh, this is drive performance, and it really isn't. Like, I, I, I'm a vessel for this entity that comes through, and she, unlike me, is, has no hesitation about being very clear with her language about these spiritual matters. And, um, but what, what the process is for me is a, it's, it's quite literally a radical surrender of my body. My posture changes, my breathing changes. Anyone here who's seen her knows, like, it, I go away and she's there, and it's a different, it's a different thing. Um, and what that says to me is that our bodies are sites that are not rigid, not ultimately defined, are constantly in motion, and are, are capable, maybe even susceptible, to transformation and being used, like let's say if I'm using, I'm, you're, I'm here, Daniel, speaking to you, and I'm in a very, let, I'm like a very cut and dry, bad analogy here, but I'm in a classical mode speaking to you. Order, it makes sense. When Jo Mama comes, she plays jazz. So she takes this same instrument, but she uses it in radically different ways than I use my body, <laughs> which then suggests that my body can be used in radically different ways, right? So it's a kind of, in a way, it's a theoretically we might call it a queer space, right? Like I can queer the body, I can do something with it that's not supposed to be done within uh, the rigid system, devil is alive, right? Um, and I think that suggests something about the mutability of identity, about the possibility that we can leave behind a lot of the ideas about what the boundaries are for ourselves and for others. And it becomes dangerous as a result in a system that depends on us being identified. It also so, blurs yeah. the boundaries between, uh, yeah. or helps us re-blur the boundaries between us and nature. A hundred thousand um, percent. Yeah. And it relates to transformation. Yeah. And I think when we're working physically in different, whatever the practice is, whether it's martial arts, what you're talking about, what we do here, what other people do, in some ways you're taking some, you're working very concretely on a cellular level, yeah. like on the body. And when those small transformations occur, whether it's being able to make a higher kick or being able to transform in some way, you're sort of redefining possibilities. Right. In which case, you're, if your sense of what's possible is changing physically, um, <clears throat> then uh, that proves as a possibility for other possibilities to change. Um, I would like to turn to you, my old friend, Stacy. Um, <laughs> old is right. Old, yeah. yeah. Not like we've known each other very long, just in terms of the age. Um, I don't know if I want to ask a specific question. I sort of do. Um, I, this, is, I, this, is, uh, this terrain is why I'm at Double Edge. Um, and, you know, these, you know, Stacey and Carlos, in the sense of, if, it's always hard to, and I guess it, I don't know why there should be a disclaimer about uh, ancestry, <laughs> you know, or lineage, right? And so I just read about how, um, like, the master always knows the importance of the student because of the, the preciousness of lineage, of mm -hmm. future. Um, so I, I don't walk around feeling like a student, but that, that past exists for me. St I mean, it, it, that, you know, the past exists in the present. And coming here and um, being shown an aspect of, uh, for me, the Jewish culture, which is not, it's not the way I grew up. <laughs> it's not definitely what is available most of the time. It's not available in most, um, in me most cases I think tradition has sort of burdened the practice of, uh, of becoming present in, in um, deep thought or in, or in um, deep search. And uh, you know, I had read and had been introduced to um, Kabbalistic things in the past, but its integration to the work in Double Edge was especially meaningful, in some ways concrete, in some ways accessible in some ways human. Um, so I'm interested if you can talk a little bit about how this came into your life and into your artistic work. Um, um, yes. I think um, I also didn't grow up with a real practice of 
Judaism. Um, my family was um, sort of um, people who fled Central Europe in, and denying their past. Um, so um, my interest was because um, I, I couldn't, I needed a past. Um, it didn't start in when I was born. Mm -hmm. So um, I started um, searching for that past. Um, however, something in me is very um, maybe rebellious and so I couldn't accept also just the given um, writings or anything of what I was searching for. So I started to look in a little bit different places. One of the main things was um, in the desert in Israel and Egypt, um, where I spent three months at a young time, uh, pretty much by myself. And so um, I started to see that the earth was uh, where the answers were, um, and that um, there actually weren't any answers. There were a lot of questions. So I, I think the journey for me is a journey of questions. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of um, sort of precepts or concepts or writings, um, a huge amount of wisdom that are all, for me, they're all questions. Um, and that's not really the same as like, take what you want, um, which I also am rebellious against. Um, it is really a, a deep question in myself of what should be and what shouldn't be and what's a lie and what's genuine and what's authentic and what is um, training that is helping me to be open to those questions and what is training that I have experienced in my life and still experience today that is taking me away from seeing um, the reality around me. So um, from, from that desert, I think the other important thing is meeting Rena Moretzka in Poland um, around the same time, and she's um, the founding actress of um, Grotowski's Laboratory, and she opened training to me. And I don't have any problem calling her my teacher today, even though we're colleagues and collaborators. Um, and I'm hoping I'm a student forever. <laughs> so um, I like being a student. Um, I think that um, that training gave a practice to me or a way of putting that into my body. Um, and then I think I spent a long time in a kind of um, dual reality that I didn't think went together. One, the desert, which I'm going to call survival. I also like that word, survival. Um, I have, and Double Edge has. Um, and the other was more internal and intimate. Um, and so, um, moving forward, I think the the intimate part had a real, um, let's say, it won for a really long time. So I really needed to spend a lot of time inside of myself um, and inside even with my few ensemble members uh, when Double Edge started and um, almost denying the rest of the world, um, except as they wanted to come inside with me, which wasn't certainly not a lot of people. 
Um, so it was a very rigorous practice, and it was also, um, I think, um, opened up more of the Kabbalistic journey for me, um, which I think I got to that search um, primarily because um, in all the Jewish and all the theatrical and all the world uh, things that I was doing, there wasn't a real place for women. Um, so I think I needed to find something that included the uh, uh, divine woman uh, presence. So I finally found that and that search was extremely important and meaningful for me and also gave me the ultimate possibility to um, open myself up to other people. Um, and that eventually is quite open and um, <laughs> is are. now um, really all that is a combination of these two forces which is the word I use as community. Um, I, I want to take that out of the lie word and put it into um, the humanity, um, not just humanity, um, but also the other species that we exist with and the land and all of that is part of that um, search now. What, what is the, the Kabbalah? Um, it is to receive. Um, so it is um, in the the way that it's written is that there's a series of books which are questions um, which have been written over centuries. Um, for me it's a search for um, ways to confront myself and ask myself questions and see how to receive and how to give um, and um, how to limit in, in a just way um, and how to resist limits in a just way. Does that relate to the rigorous practice you were talking about in the, the sort of formative years? Yeah, I think that one needs to have some uh, signposts um, in order to be able to continue uh, a practice and also to, um, I think, to survive in light of the huge amount of pressure to uh, give in to answers and give in to stereotypes and give in to um, not thinking it's okay to uh, be a female or anything else. What was that rigorous practice? Was this training? It's training in the larger sense is um, there's training, there's physical training, um, which I think is um, a blessing. And there is, um, let's say, creative training, which maybe stems from physical training or um, from engaging your, yourself fully. Um, there's training of the imagination, which is related to all those things but also includes um, reading and walking and um, playing with your dog uh, <laughs> I mean or other things besides just oneself I think um, I was thinking this morning that um, I think interruption is extremely important for a practice, um, for me now. At one point, it was very much like, we're going into the training space, nobody's allowed in there, and 
I'm sure some of you remember that. And um, we are doing that and we won't drink anything and we will uh, just go. Um, which still has its meaning, I think. But um, I was watching some friends train in, at Grenland Free Theater in Norway a long, long time ago. And um, they had a five-year-old, um, and he ran into the room. And they were all upset because I was watching, and they wanted to show how disciplined they were and stuff. And I thought, this was the best part of training. <laughs> Everybody woke up and had to really um, adjust themselves. So then I was thinking, well, when I had kids, they interrupted all the time, especially one of them. Um, and um, that was really great for me because I didn't think anymore that I was the only important thing on earth. Uh, I, I had to recognize that there was something always going to be more important than my practice. Um, so my practice had to find a way to um, be its ultimate self in light of what else was important. Um, I, I then, um, after my kids weren't interrupting me anymore, um, I, I read the book Ishmael. And um, I realized, oh, I have to do this by myself now. Like, my idea of myself has to be always in consideration of the world, the earth, everything that exists. So I think um, that's what it is today. <clears throat> hey, Carlos. This has just sort of occurred to me, so I don't know if this will be helpful or not, but before you came to the Double Edge, you um, founded a theater company for many years in our Buenos Aires that was called Diablo Mundo. Um, can you say something about why Diablo Mundo? Does, does the name of Devil World yes. relate to this conversation? Absolutely. Um, but I was not aware, you know, somehow I, you know, I, I need to confess I'm afraid to about this. Uh, and in your presence, because I, I think I feel a great deal of respect for all of you. Although I don't know many of you, I have heard. And so it's difficult to, to jump into a conversation uh, where you're going to talk about uh, <clears throat> some aspects of vulnerability, which I think it is impossible not to talk about an inner journey without not mentioning that one makes oneself vulnerable. Like, and I think I'm redundant already because I feel I, I, I'm listening to from all of you this. So. But forgive my redundancy, and uh, also please, 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 please interrupt me. <laughs> because I don't think that what I'm going to say, if I manage to say anything, um, is um, will have... So to me, the language, in my opinion, or my feeling, um, which is not too much of a thinking, but more feeling, is that when we talk, the context is much larger than what we say. Mm -hmm. So I, I love, like you're nodding already, it gives me such a relief. Because <laughs> I, I, know, I know you're with me. So say whatever, like the kid, you know? And Simon there, he can, he can say something. Um, so I, I was very afraid um, of many things. Um, but probably I was very afraid of being, um, of being. Mm. Um, and then I landed in, in, a, in a family that was denying and forgetting origins and, and that sort of was trying to assimilate and that have had principles but then they were forgetting. And <coughs> a very turbulent time and I, I felt the urge to change things. And I didn't know how or what to do. What, what turbulence? Um, the turbulence was, well, I mean, 
is the same thing that is happening now. Mm. Sorry if I'm saying something, uh, but uh, you know, I feel that, that I, I landed in Argentina. The, the, what I remember in the 60s before the, the dictatorship is very similar to what's happening with Donald Trump here and all the stuff. And with uh, assassination of people of all kinds that you can see, and I think it's all connected with a lot of things, but I'm not going to go in there. Um, so this was a very turbulent time, and I, I, I traveled, and my family took me to places, and I, I was very dissatisfied with that. And um, I thought that there needed to be changes, and I started creating groups. And then my family decided to put me in a British school, to, because you know, I had high scores in school, which was a mistake. So they sent me to the school, which was horrible. It was a torture. And I mean, and by that I'm, I'm not gonna go into the gory details, but yes, we did have physical torture as students. But it was in the 60s, so you, mm -hmm. some of you can imagine. And um, I started to rebel, and rebel, and rebel, and rebel, and rebel, and my siblings did the same thing, and it was not a good idea to do it at that time. Um, but then I get a little bit fixed, or fixated. One, because, you know, I was a boy, and I was trained as a boy, so... Um, I was afraid of a lot of things that, you know, now I recognize, and maybe I'm still afraid, but at least now I can see that. And, um, like, my, you know, my feminine side was very hidden, and, and Normally, you know, I did boxing, I did rugby, I played soccer, or football, like we call it. I got into professional. I was an activist, I was outside in the streets, and all of a sudden we started gathering these groups and I became a, a catalyst or, or organizer, and, and I organized a lot of groups. And, uh, and we started seeing that this world was the way it was. And, um, and we started to see the, the facets of the, of the devil. Now, we started reading, again, literature was a very important piece of that period, and still is. And there was a writer in the 19th century uh, from Spain, uh, Jose de Espronceda, who wrote this wonderful poem. He's an anarchist, a writer in, in 1850. Uh, it was called The Devil Work, or The Devil's Work, El Diablo Mundo. So we decided to make it one word and say, this is what it is. This is the word, and that's how we're going to name ourselves. And uh, at the time, then, you know, the, the, the eruption of the, what they call the Dirty War, Dirty War, which is not a, a warfare, but a mafia, which is so similar to what's happening here, because you get shot dead, any time, any minute, and there's no warning of anything. And there's no, no normalcy. It's not like something you can, you know, a pattern that you're following. You get out on the street, and somebody can take you. And I feel more and more that that's happening here. And it's happening everywhere in the world. And people call it terrorism, and those are media words. I think that the, the thing is that it's a, a, a hidden warfare where, of course, in my opinion, sorry for the, 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 the mysticism, in my opinion, has to do more with the weapon industry and other industries than with either religious thinking or... or but what's interesting, though, Carlos, is that one of your responses to this was rooted in and inspired by traditions. Yes. Pre-existing traditions. Yes. Um, not only to form groups, but also to gather. Yes. And in Carnival. Yes, but I didn't know. I didn't know this. Yeah. So... But Carnival and Morga has been I with was, you for a long, long yeah, time. Yeah, but it was banned. So, like circus, everything that was banned, I was attracted to. Rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> so I started producing rock and roll. And, and because it was banned, and then the long hair, and then I said, you know, no to tango, because it's the, it's, you know, the military took it as the national thing, the macho thing to do. Although I didn't know a lot of things about tango, but then I learned. So, but in order, yes, 
I was attracted to a lot of traditional things, and I also worked with a lot of community, like the Diaguita community in the north, which I went to explore what they would call the Walitzen, or Walicho, which is, um, an, I didn't know anything. So now I know it's, a, it's an area of energy. I thought it was just making po po potions and, and making people fall in love and things like that. <laughs> But when I was doing that, somebody talked to me about Kabbalah and was one of the natives. And I was like, wow. So, yes, I did a lot of research. I did a lot of Mardi Gras things, which was some of how subversive. Now, how do you do Mardi Gras subversive? That is something. One day we'll need to talk about that. Because <laughs> yeah, we did it. Uh, it was invisible, but it happened. And why, um, why, why do you think it was important? Like, why did it resonate? You've talked to me about these traditions. Yeah. The, the traditions in Carnival, where they come. Can you say a little bit where the, these, some of the traditions come from? Because although you didn't know at the time, you do know now. Yeah, it's... So, I have the sense, and I might be wrong, and that, that Latin America is a little more fused than culturally than than the the north. Like, you know, I always think that we're we are very similar North America and South America and Central America, but somehow it you know in the where the border is established now by the river that people need to swim to get in here. Um, there is like you know, this is a positive and a negative of like a, in a photograph. Uh, the side in the south I think Although there is segregation, although there is, oh, not segregation, but there is racism, let's say, racism, um, a lot, and violent. There are, for some reason, maybe because of the Catholic background, but, you know, like, like my father, he had multiple families that we didn't know. So we are mixed with people that we don't know, but then we are mixed. So, so it becomes like, you know, I was feeling this thing like I, I'm mestizo, I'm not really white, although I am white. But um, one of my grandmothers came from Abyssinia and Brazil, so there is, you know, she looks African, but she, her, her skin is different. And um, so all those things were calling somehow, but I didn't know that they were calling. And uh, I didn't know a lot of these things until I, I met Stacy. And that's why I think that the best entry point to talk or to approach inner work is a love story. <laughs> Particularly it's mine. Because then I'm really vulnerable. So the night I met Stacy, we had a huge fight. <laughs> <laughs> this book was here. Like, imagine the room. <laughs> and I come in, and I'm talking about, I felt attracted. I over, I'm, I'm attracted to women. I am. No shame in your game. No. <laughs> now I'm, I'm, now I, and I'm attracted to more people than women. So, all the varieties. But, uh, it's, uh, we're talking about inner. Don't sign. <laughs> so I enter and I see that and I enter with this discourse like I'm an activist and I'm not going to do theater ever again and uh, so what are you doing now and so I'm, I just had to be a manager and a theater producer and she looked at me and she said you're full of shit and I'm like where is the American niceness here <laughs> you know I was told but I said, okay, I'll take it. And I started fighting. And I called her that she was a, a, a gringa privilege that, you know, how do you dare talk to me? You don't know what, what you know, a necessity is. And uh, I was really dumb. I still am, but now I, at least I can see it. Um, <laughs> and I saw the book. And it was like, you know, these people talk to me about this. And, I have the habit of not going into these traditions unless I know somebody from the tradition that, mm. like I wouldn't dare to do, I, I admire Indian culture, but I won't, it was Amrita that helped me a lot, 
you know, if I don't have somebody that is from the culture, I don't, I read and stuff, but I, I start practicing things when I have somebody like, you know, you say who rings the bell, you do, right? Because you're bringing me there. So I believe in that, that tradition is a call, and I think that, that somehow my former life, just to go back to, to the question, was, was truncated by sort of like an industrial model that I was trained into. And I rebelled and I resisted, and it was not until I found through Stacy, Kabbalah, and other things, my journey, like the birds, that I understood that I was in a journey of my inner self, that I could connect all of these dots that are so many. And by the way, that year was my 40th birthday. So, which in Kabbalah tradition is the year you're allowed to access, to begin the journey, right? Because I'm also not from the culture, but being trained by. So it was very, I mean, so many connections, which brings me to the idea of chance and how much we do not have control. And we cannot plan. You know what you were saying about planning? I, there's this Hasidic joke that if you want to make God laugh, well, they don't say God because you cannot say that, but if you want to make God laugh, tell, it, tell him your plans or tell her your plans. <laughs> um, so I didn't plan any of this. I, uh, I'm still not planning, um, and things keep happening, like this is amazing. And uh, what more of an inner journey that have this opportunity to start knowing somebody else, you know, to be the student of other people. So... Great. Um, I'd like to jump to you, Todd. Before I do that, and maybe you want to be the person Anyone here have any responding before I say something else or ask something else? No? Okay. Um, yeah, you have something on your mind? Go ahead. No, you. Yeah. No, I... Uh, yeah, no, I'm just sitting here in total terror. So I, I understand your feeling of vulnerability because... First of all, I really wanted to go last, but then I went, I'm going last, and so I'm <laughs> sitting with all this, you know, uh, for the whole time, and this is just something, I, you know, they say about, don't talk about sex or money or religion. I mean, this is it for me. <laughs> this is like the thing that I don't want to talk about. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, it, um, and as I'm sitting here listening to you all, I'm realizing it's the thing I think about all the time. Mm -hmm. Do you know, so um, I'm sitting in a state of uh, sort of petrified self-revelation um, about the way that I have sort of glommed onto other people's spiritual searches as a way of um, taking my own. So I guess that's what I would talk about now, unless you had a question. That's what I'm talking about now. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, a, a few things. Um, I guess I have, so these are all words I've never used. So, you know, esoteric, m mysticism, I can't even say it, m m m m <laughs> mysticism, you know, um, Kabbalah, you know, all these things. I was raised in, you know, the liturgy of my childhood was the American musical theater canon, you know, from like George Gershwin to Stephen Sondheim. Um, uh, and there is, you know, uh, essentially, I'm, I'm married to a, a Jew and was, I grew up in a Jewish suburb, post-war suburb, that was all about forgetting. So I didn't know that in most of the houses around me lived survive, grandparents who were survivors and spoke Yiddish, but I didn't go to any of the services. I didn't know this. I just knew that we were all happy and clean. You know. um, and uh, you know, and so then, as we're engaging with this topic, I'm a, I'm aware that in almost every part of my life, I'm in contact with people who are um, explicitly searching uh, in some spiritual way, including with 
playwrights who are all about you know writing invisible things and making them visible. I've been working on two books lately with um, older artists. Um, one is Andre Gregory, the theater director. So this book is about a man who, you know, has a guru, and uh, whose great teacher and close friend was Grotowski, and who um, is kind of famous as a storyteller of spiritual quest. And, um, and we're, you know, we're so close, and yet I'm aware that the quest is all his. And my quest is, what does it mean to be working with an 82-year-old artist in terms of planning the next 20 some years of my life. How do I live? How do I use this example in order to um, teach myself how to live? The other book I've been working on is a book of the writings of Zelda Fitchhandler, who some of you know is a founder of the regional theater movement and arena stage and um, died last uh, about, about eight or nine days ago. And it's the same thing. Zelda was 91 and wise in her bones and thoughtful in every movement of her life. And as I was writing a little uh, memory piece for her, for uh, American theater, and I realized that my sentence structure is stolen from her. You know, my values somehow are her values, even though I, I became intimate with her much later in her life, but I so sort of um, attached myself through whatever learning to the people who came up with her. Um, you know, I've, I've made a collection of the early writings of the theater in America that from in the voices of other people, so it's not even like taking it as my own, but it's an attempt to find um, the, the kind of ancestry that many of you have identified, and that's so strong in you, Daniel. Um, but I never really identify it as my own ancestry, except I was compelled to do it, you know. Um, and then, you know, and the work with playwrights is really, I mean, I think about it as service, but as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm sort of shocked to, um, to contemplate the fact that it's actually self-service because I'm trying to learn things that I don't feel um, empowered or, or like I have the means to learn on my own. So like I'm glomming on to Daniel's journey or another writer's journey as a way of um, sort of understanding what it really means to live in this inner space and to trust that work and then to um, have the you know the foolhardiness of giving it to other people to totally fuck up, do you know? And but to be in that room with other people, um, or you know, now I'm just rambling it. But you know, the work at New Dramatists was for me really um, is a service organization, a laboratory for playwrights, a residency program, and I realized that everything in my life there was about finding ways to help the playwrights turn toward each other is a way of kind of spreading their individual vitality. That's what I think I meant by community. And so this sort of connectivity of that is actually a belief in spiritual community. But that's a phrase that I never want to utter again and have never actually uttered before, you know, would try not to. So, you know, um, I think that's, uh, that's where I would begin, Matthew. I mean, it, it's, a, it's this kind of like secret. And not, it's not reluctant. I mean, none of these things are reluctant, but they sort of, it's parasitical in a way. It's like, I depend on the bodies of others to do my spiritual work for me. Which is not a, a problem. No, it's not actually maybe sort it's of not. part of the equation yeah. is the, the dependence on the other. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also the surrender of, of identity. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what's interesting to me is the value of the vulnerability and also the apprehension, which is also part of our ancestry. Like mm -hmm. we inherit um, our enlightenment frameworks 
and our um, industrial age frameworks, which mean that we can't comfortably um, be too subjective or too uh, uh, emotionally um, unbound mm -hmm. or too enthusiastic to some degree without <laughs> some preparation yeah. <laughs> or too intuitive. Yeah. And these are all aspects of, um, of mystical thought and also um, that it is not uh, analytical um, and that we need <clears throat> we need the, these, the, the, the borders between each other to be porous in a way in order to have any type of revelation. Um, and then we need to keep, it's very dynamic. Right. Like the tra training is very important because you have all these metaphors that are about the thing. Like to walk on a ball, to walk on a ball, <coughs> you, 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 you try to find balance on walking on a ball. Um, I would ask Milena to say something, but she's very busy mm -hmm. uh, conducting the, the technology. But to walk on the ball, to find balance in the ball, can you say something about it? What's the essence of walking on the ball? Um, yes, sorry, I didn't follow what you said before. Doesn't matter. Sorry. Yeah. Um, the essence is that you're never still. In order to keep the balance, you have to always make small movements to adjust all the time, and that's how you find the balance. Mm -hmm. So it's a conversation with a, a, an object which cannot provide balance. Um, so you're constantly moving. Yeah. Or, or that provides the ultimate balance. <laughs> right. Because one of the things that I was just thinking when you said that is that we need to sort of like surrender to the fact that everything is paradoxical. So as soon as we, we name the, the one term of the equation, because it's an equation, you know, algebra is not a, it's a philosophical discovery, it's not a mathematical, it's an ethical. As, as soon as you, as, as soon as you, you talking about the other, you're talking about yourself. We trust what happened to me when I, when I met Stacy. You know, it was like, oh, actually, I need to go into myself in order to work with others, because right now I'm empty. You know, I, I, I took all of the. Right. Well, I mean, and it seems like one of the paradoxes, and I, and I, I guess, I, um, I, I feel the need always to be practical about this too, is that. We, uh, I, I feel in myself the need to look for people who are akin to me and, that, and to move with people who are complementary and other than me. So I, live, so I live in a secret twinship with Eric N., who some of you know. So Eric is um, a deeply Catholic activist, experimental playwright, international activist, and he has for many years been working with silence, uh, silent practices. Yes. And he did it here. He did it here. He worked on uh, something here I learned yesterday. And I, um, and I lead artist retreats that are sort of cross-disciplinary. And we've come to refer to his work as silent and mine as noisy, yes. you know? And I feel myself to be the secular Jew with him. And he's the Thomas Merton, you right. know, <laughs> with me, this monkish, precise, haiku speaking person and I'm this messy schmuck from, you know um, from middle America and um, and so a couple years ago before I, I moved to Seattle we were talking about trying to merge these two practices in a kind of foundation or um, center or something, but neither of us, of course, wanted to get our hands dirty and have to raise the money to do it. So it sort of exists as this floating thing. But I feel that in terms of the complement, it's like I, I wouldn't even have an idea who I was exactly. if somebody didn't exist who both shared something and also was utterly different. Completes. Yes. Completes right. that. Right. That is missing. So there's two things that are sort of rattling in my, my brain right now that I'll just put out there and hopefully people can, can grab onto it. Um, uh, those two things are, the how does this, what do we want? <laughs> what we want, I think, as at least those of us concerned with the live arts, is uh, to feel the most alive and to conduct and transmit in order for groups of people to feel more alive again and to access highest self and elevate the whole, right? So we start with some form of practice that allows us 
hopefully, a, a prayer <laughs> to tune to mystery, uh, expand, <clears throat> and invite, and then create, and create processes that will then hopefully instigate and animate more creativity and more aliveness. So I think, I would say that's one thing we want, but I'd like maybe someone to reinterpret that. Yeah. Let me say one other thing, and then hopefully someone will grab it. That there is a, in a, a deep individual concern. There is, a, we, are, we are born alone and we die alone to some degree. If you, that's maybe, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> but let's say there is a need to go inside, inside one, and then there's a need to have an other. And then there's this very interesting question about how does a group, how does a group travel with this? How does a group grow and stay in re regenerated sense of belief? How does the tribe, with or without land, <clears throat> create the practices like you're talking about with Eric that carry forth evolution in a group? Um, you've talked about, uh, with me at least, and in Double Edge, this story of, of the, the Parde Smith myth, which is important for a group because you have many people seeking some type of, of knowledge of sorts. Um, so how this plays into the group process, so those, those are the two things. What's the Pardes myth? Is it Pardes? The, the Pardes myth is about um, seeking knowledge and how to, um, it's about four rabbis um, seeking knowledge, the well of knowledge in Pardes, which is, means garden or paradise. Um, daring to go in there and um, and how to approach the water of knowledge and what happens to them. Um, and I, I think it's really important and it in some weird way relates to what I was going to say which might not have anything to do with what you said but I want to say it anyway. Um, because a lot of us we're, we're talking about our being afraid to talk and we're talking about uh, fears and stuff like that. And I, I think um, in the last year of this society, um, I want to try to look at myself and my fears in a different way. Um, and um, like, I, I don't like to talk about the inner things, or maybe I don't like to talk that much um, <laughs> in any way, but um, I think that our practices, whatever they are, um, need to instill us, must instill us with the courage to speak um, and to overcome our fears about speaking and sharing our truths, whatever our truths are, um, whatever our practices, whatever our mysticism is, whatever we call what is genuine to us, because there's a lot out there that's, that is part of a big lie, and the only way to fight that is, I mean, maybe not the only way, but a necessary way to fight that is by us sharing truths. Um, and um, the reality of love and the reality of our creativity and our imagination, our possibilities, our spirituality, um, that's not what's out there. Um, so, I want to be, force myself to not use the word fear in terms of my um, love, but use it in terms of fighting uh, the fear I have or the lack thereof. Can I toss in a um, thousand percent amen I'll shade to that, a thousand percent. <laughs> and, um, you know, I went, when Alice Coltrane, whom I mentioned earlier, died, I went to the memorial service that they held for her at uh, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City, and it was like all the people who were still living who had played with her, and like they just played jet, like it was, the whole building was going like this, and it was just insane. But it was peppered with remembrances of her, 
Um, she had a deep spiritual practice that was rooted in Hinduism. She lived in the, on the West Coast and like, you know, had a long, like for, for decades had been part of this group of people who lived together in a kind, on land, you know, all this. But they said, you know, here are some things that she has said. And uh, this one, I, I'll just put it out there and then I want to share a little thing with you. Um, they'll be there. They'll be moving in a translinear path. Boom! Right? And what that says to me, and this is what I want to kind of put out, and this is like opening up the big can of worms that I think a lot of people, myself included, get nervous about talking about in public, is we're not only talking about the living. We're talking about yes. our being across time. Yes. And if I, if I want to be genuine with you, I will say that some of my deepest relationships are with people who are no longer living, right? And with ideas that, are, are, that belong to people who are no longer on the planet. And dare I say, people who haven't gotten here yet, right? And so it's a space that is rife for, like, you can immediately put me out with the New Age crystal over in there. <laughs> like, they'd be like, okay, that's that cat. But, but in reality, what, I, what I'm saying is that, that I, I know from my, my study of history, in particular my study of the black American experience, that the, the people that we often go to, who we, we quote them, and I'm going to go back to the you know, oft-quoted Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, whatever. They could not have lived their life if they believed that their life was the end. Yes. They yes. couldn't have done it. And they couldn't have done it because the, the circumstances did not change in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. But what they saw was beyond their lifetime. Yes. So they knew that they were part of a conversation that was moving in a translinear path, right? Yeah. So if that is the case, if I'm part of a larger thing, what is that central message that I want to be involved in? I want to be involved in a message of love, which is a way of saying that there are energies that are generative en energies, like other people might call it biophilic, right? Like mm -hmm. I want to be involved in something that is generative, life-giving, life-sustaining, and life including death, life including loss, life including doubt, life including fear and uncertainty, all of those things are present in life, right? But that I am not willing to sacrifice the life force to fear and limitation and the idea of certainty. I'm not willing to do it, right? So I'm currently working on this project that we're doing this fall and one of the persona in the piece is Dr. George Washington Carver. I don't know how many people know much about him other than like he made stuff with peanuts, like, you know, from uh, your Black History Month calendar. Um, but he was a mystic. He was a scientist who was a mystic, who, who lived on the land. He, he was at Tuskegee University and famously started their science and ag agriculture department. And he, you know, they, they, they asked him when he was there, in many interviews, like, how do, you, how do you know how to take this plant and do all of these things with this plant? And instead of saying, well, you know, I break things down in the, in, the, in the Petri dish or under the microscope, he said, I go out into the woods before dawn and I take the flower of the plant that I'm going to be working on and I sit with it mm -hmm. and it tells me what to do. <laughs> right? So if I can, I just want to do this whole thing. Um, so, we, I just got back from a residency with Samora Pinderhughes, the great, extraordinary jazz musician, and we're, we've been writing songs for the show. And this is brand new. There are no chord changes, so it'll sound like I'm saying off-key. Um, if you love a thing enough, it will reveal its secrets to you. Unlock all its codes and keys and send the message through you. So says the man who talks to flowers. Science, yes, but so divine. In nature you will find your guide to mystic senses of your life that escape definition. So says the man who talks to flowers. In wee hours of the morning, I walk the woods to greet first light. 
all my worry and all my wanting grow pale beneath the burden by the flower is a portal to the universe so wide its trumpet ear placed to my eye nameless wonders i do spy so says the man who talks to flowers my life in service to the science my life in service to the race an elegant tale to tell a flower in my lapel if you can love with all your heart and love without an ounce of fear, you will surrender all you know and open up your inner ear. Almost done. Uh, <laughs> if you love me as I do you, I will visit in your dreams and whisper secrets bold unto you, leading you to mystic streams. So says the man who talks to flowers. So says the man who talks to flower. Yeah. It's, it's this idea that there is so much more available to us than we avail ourselves of if we get over the idea that it stops with us or that it started with us. Yeah. Yeah. And Daniel, I mean, I have to say as a, as a you know, prosaic secularist, that that's just, um, that's not entirely mystical. It's actual, we know this. We have memory, we have history, we have children. Do you know what I mean? There's just, there's, the, and we have senses that are not just our minds when we sit with the flowers. Do you know what I mean? So I, for me, that uh, I, I completely enter what you say as a sort of mystical reality, but I also, feel like, you know, we gather around in the apartment of someone who died last week mm -hmm. and we tell stories and we've all been changed by this person and we take that change into our lives and presumably other people are affected by it too and it kind of, you know, it spreads in that way. So, I, Altus, it's not a, it's not a contradiction, it's sort of like, and even in the secular space, in the kind of, in a, with, from someone who wouldn't use the term mysticism, that's accurate to me. Mm -hmm. But then what, where does the struggle, or where does the struggle take root? Because if it's so obvious, if it's so material and it's so mystical, why are we, why, why are we missing it? Or why do we feel that we're missing it? I, I, I can Thanks. try. I, I, I've been thinking about that. I think we, or I, I, let me talk, me, not we, but me, I, I identify that I, I do get seduced by the certainty. Uh, like, you know, anger is an easier response than love. Uh, blame others is an easier response and it doesn't require that big of an effort. It does require effort, but, it, but it's, it, in the beginning, you know, somebody that was, a, I, I love learning to do uh, work in the land from people that do work, and somebody told me once, they, be careful with the task that is easy at the beginning, because normally at the end it's a, it's a nightmare. <laughs> or, you know, if you do a task really meticulously and really effort in the beginning, at the end you're flying. He said those things and I was like, wow, that's so philosophical. And uh, I took it to heart, I still do. Um, so we, cre we, we get enamored to patterns and matrix of behavior, of work, so of like, you know, how we communicate is not about the word. The word is a tool. It's like, you know, a fork is as dangerous as a missile. You can, you can poke somebody's eyes with a fork. Everything is dangerous. Any tool is dangerous, but it's up to us to operate them safely and to our advantage. So, it, but it's easy. I find myself easy and sort of like um, giving into that pleasure and then trying to shake myself out of that and, and go to the effort, because anything requires effort. The easy also requires effort, but, but it's, it's numbing. You know, the, we had, um, from Indonesia, um, 
master here for years and he was training us and, and one day he told me uh, when I was explaining this to him he said well yeah he said it's just like the, the frog and the, and the boiling pot <laughs> and I said what is it well you ate frogs when you were a kid yeah, yeah I did so you notice that if you grab a, a frog alive and you throw it into a frying pan the frog will jump up immediately but try putting a frog in a pot and, and then turn the, the heat on. The frog will die. It would get enamored with that heat and not feed it, not feed it until it's too late. And it won't react. So I also thought about that to myself. I said, well, maybe I'm like the frog in the, in the pot. You know, I let myself numb. Can I, can I, I need to say something. Of course. Are you, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Of course. Um, there's also systemic structures whose power and survival depend on our belongings, yes. depend on our dislocation, depend on our disconnection from tradition, from community, and from real self. And they are very strong, and they're all around us in politics and advertising. It absolutely, these structures, systemic structures, depend on us being blind and not aware. And they are the real power. This is just an insight, not a question. Um, I'll just share um, something from that Moni, Moni K. Trask shared with me, um, who's a Native Hawaiian advocate. Um, she said, we live in a, um, an information society. And um, a lot of the way we manage things is through information. And, folks don't really understand the difference between information and knowledge. Yeah. And knowledge is comes with um, a lot of responsibility and it is it is gifted to you. It is a yes. it is a orientation uh, and it is a um, it is something that requires you to be position yourself as a receiver and um, and a giver with responsibility across generations. And it also comes with the bearing of grace and love. Uh, so I, I just wanted to, and that to me kind of was that bridge between this, this disassociation um, between, you know, and that isn't necessarily about religious practice as mm -hmm. it is just an orientation yeah. to how we, because we're bombarded with information, even even um, indoctrinated, yes, and even information about religion or practice, we're just yes. bombarded with it. But are we oriented? Um, so I want to come back to Depunker. We haven't heard from you in a bit, and I saw you writing. Well, I'm writing what others are saying. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, no. uh, I I think when we give up uh, the desire to. Uh, you know, be original, because you know, uh, yes. then we uh, in, and we automatically realize that we are a part of a lineage. Uh, in America, in North America, there is a there's a strong desire to sort of you know, which are very sub subconsciously we take it from the corporate world, but we don't f frame it that way about patenting, like my movement, yeah. Yeah. my idea, my actually, I mean. Uh, the ideas emerge and then we give it an English term called mystical or non-mystical or we give it a term, you know, the, uh, I just want to address, uh, you know, somehow when we use the word, you know, it's such a personal journey. So in anything that we talk about becomes like the, you know, uh, sort of prescriptive and that's not the intention. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, in in Hinduism, uh, you know, it's a way, way of life. It's an English translation that calls it a religion. It isn't one. Um, uh, you know, it's really a way of life. Uh, and uh, we have four Vedas. Uh, uh, and the fifth Veda, uh, I'm, I'm just bringing it back to theater, because that we are practitioners of theater, is the Natya Shastra. Uh, Natya Shastra is considered to be the fifth Veda, uh, which is a book on philosophy. Um, and in it, uh, how in practice, your question was in practice, how do we, pra uh, how is there a praxis uh, informs it that, you know, even the Aristotelian poetics, 
uh, you know, has a big, the story structure, the beginning, middle and end. Uh, whereas Eastern dramaturgy, uh, the Trinity, um, uh, Trinity itself is a Christian word, uh, 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 is, is need, uh, desire and revelation. Uh, so th that's the three. So there's a need uh, for us. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a need inside our bodies that, and the need, if it just stays within us, you know, it, it can eat us up or make us into uh, self-aggrandized, self-proclaimed leaders. So the need has to uh, live in uh, desire of a community. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that, that means the intentionality of the need pushes us to a desireness. Of, is there a word called desireness? Mm -hmm. yeah, Academics in the room. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, and, and then it's revelation. That means the truth exists. Uh, it gets revealed to us. So which is the distinct difference from the Western uh, protagonist, the hero's journey, the hero unties the knot, rising action, falling action, solves the problem and voila. Uh, 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 whereas the, the, in Revelation is a very powerful word, you know, that it already exists. You know, elders have thought through it, future generations have thought through it. We are just a tiny speck in the, you know, so there's no desire to really patent a movement on my name. You know, Gandhi said he's always afraid of uh, any ism, especially when it uh, preceded by a proper noun, right? You know, but people did their PhDs on Gandhiism. Uh, you know, uh, it's just contradicting its basic coherency. Uh, so, and another aspect, which, uh, you know, so we, we practice that even in our staging, because time is seen, like in many uh, ancient cultures, cyclical uh, in, in Eastern dramaturgy. So uh, there is no ending of a scene. There is no ending of a generation. Like December is not, winter of discontent does not exist uh, uh, in our thought process because it's seen as a rebirth. Uh, and, and so even in some of my movement, uh, especially when I direct in regional theaters, uh, lighting designers that I don't choose always have a problem that, you know, suppose this scene is over here, I will always have one person just walking across. Uh, like even actually yesterday's play, how you wanted to remember her that she's, uh, you know, moving, uh, it does not end. Right. And so the lighting designers say, but that's another cue. <laughs> um, I said, yeah, it's another cue. Yeah. But, but the play is already over. And is that a curtain call should be the next cue? I said, don't say what should be. I mean, this is what is, uh, uh, you know. So it does not end, you know, uh, it does not end. Uh, I mean, that's a part of our practice. You know, uh, uh, and I just wanted to share this thing about, you know, one of the practices, uh, maybe, uh, um, you know, called, it's called Kulam, uh, it's in the southern part of India, mm -hmm. where they practice, however, regardless of the economic strata of uh, the person, there's always, you know, they'll, if, even if the smallest of the smallest house, um, even in a corrugated shed on a, on a pavement when some people stay, they'll uh, s sweep and mop and, uh, uh, you know, it just, that small little house that they have outside and with chalk or uh, rice powder they make these designs uh, uh, you know uh, and and then during the that's how we begin the day that's how we begin our rehearsals and then during the day uh, people walk on it is street i mean people sometimes people are living on pavements you know it just uh, it, it it washes off or with footwork i mean when people are walking it does not exist after some time and to me that really uh, is very humbling uh, you, you know, that, that, uh, the desire of permanency and the desire of, um, it actually, so, it, it, does, it's, uh, it, it just does not exist. Uh, 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 you know, so, I mean, the idea that it's impermanent, so like the play, like a play, you know, we come together, we create community, we work with intention, we, we fail miserably, we celebrate powerfully, <laughs> but all that happens and then it's over. And, and, and so that practice, you know, it sort of, um, it humbles uh, and, and makes us realize the, the inf the, uh, how infinite uh, we are and how unimportant we are. Uh, uh, and, and so in Pangea especially, you know, we have to search for uh, you know, rituals which honor all our circles and because we are surrounded by multiple circles. Uh, and, and, and what gets sort of placed in the center sometimes, especially as an immigrant, uh, um, a new recent immigrant, you know, uh, I mean, the reality that the room is never empty. It is always full with people uh, who have like, the systems that are in place. 
So, so how do we create an open space in which uh, the, uh, the conversation that is messy, uh, you know, does remain represented and messy? Great. Thank you. Yeah. For starting and start for ending, um, you have a question and you'll be punctuating the conversation with this question. Please, Mark. <laughs> no, I, I, think about, I also think about the role of ego and pride and arrogance. Uh, which I think is central to what we do. I mean, I don't, I don't think, I think sometimes ego gets a bad rap, uh, but I think there's something very arrogant about putting on a performance. And there's nothing wrong with it. I don't, I don't see that as a bad thing, but I also think it's a thing, you know, that, that, that you know, in, in, in conversations of, of certainly in conversations, a lot of conversations, I, I, I would be in around, around some of these topics around religion, faith mysticism. Uh, I think we, we move, we want to, we start to move towards humility and, and kind of like our place in, in, in the world. But I think there's also something to be said about the chutzpah of, I'm going to bring together people who otherwise, like from different cultures, from all around the world, and we're going to figure it out. And that there's something beautiful about it, and there's also something arrogant about it. And that's like, again, like, I don't mean that as a, as a pejorative, as there's something wrong. But other than there's something kind of a drive, a force uh, uh, that, that, I, that I, you know, I, I, I think is present. And I don't know how it fits in, but, but, but I do feel like it's there. And, and I, don't, I don't quite have the language, but it's just the thing that's going through. I think there's, so a, there's a spectrum with humility and ecstasy. That's all, all one. And no, but humility. You know, Gandhi. I just want to say one. I mean, uh, uh, I completely. Agree, but uh, you know, Marcus Moore. I feel that it's a search. But humility, not in a point of uh, like I have elders in the in from India. Sometimes they come. They're the biggest patriarchal, arrogant assholes. Okay. You know, <laughs> but but they give a speech. Oh, I am just an artist. I serve the art. And but they go out and they believe in hierarchy. Even even Gandhi said, "Don't act humble. You're not that great." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we are talking about strong, powerful, disagreeing, political, spiritual voices, yeah. and, and and who are in search. Uh, you know, there's rigor, there's rigor uh, in that search. There is no artificial humility bullshit in that. I mean, uh, uh, because uh, there is power when everybody shows up as powerful uh, in a, in a room. But um, the point is, how do we create rooms like that? I mean, uh, just like this room is being created like yes. that, not many rooms, in many rooms we, we are invited, you know, uh, and there is a larger narrative already present, Yes. right? We are subgroups. And speaking, right? and speaking of uh, larger narratives, speaking of yeah. subgroups, to make a crude segue, um, and I'm sorry to cut you off here, um, but it's, uh, this is the question, and I think uh, we have to move on from this at the moment. We don't have to move on at all, actually. But what I want to say is that we have a, there's a resources thing up here, which I'd like to change to resources and other, other things. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to put a question up there or a thought that didn't get voiced. It'll be implemented or integrated somehow. Um, this is not the end of a conversation. This is all one conversation. But we are going to shift the landscape a little bit. So we're going to take a break. Thank you, first of all, all of you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, all of you, and thank you in TV land. Um, we're going to take a break now. It is 11.40. We're going to take a 20-minute break for whatever you want to do. And then we will be meeting uh, at noon um, under the tent. And please take a look at Sita's beautiful work. Thank you, Sita. Thank you.